So, as Spencer said, we now have, to our astonishment, seven sophonies. In 1950, we had none. Until 2010, we had a kind of a half of one. And now we have seven, we think. You can never be certain with these things, but we think that we have seven pictures by Zoffany. Um, the, uh, the Dashwood picture, of course, which is the main thing I'm going to be talking about today. So, just to compare with some other collections, as, as Spencer was saying, we're the largest collection of Zoffany's outside of London. The Tate has 11 but it's only got four on display at the moment. The whole of the National Trust has only got six, so we're just beating them. The Ashmolean and Birmingham have got three each, and the Victoria Art Gallery has two. Um, I'll show you the one, they're um, a picture of father and daughter. So um, Sophia Dumerg was the daughter of the royal dentist who was a great friend of Zoffany's. And um, this is a very lovely portrait, I think, with her um, little kitten. I love the way the kitten's got white mittens on, just like her. Um, but if you haven't seen that, and I'm sure you all have, if you haven't, do go along and, and have a look at it. So it means we've got nine in Bath, um, most of them on public display. So I thought, because we have all these Zophonies, I should tell you a bit about him. Some of you may already have been to the talk which was given a couple of years ago by Penelope Treadwell, and there was also a talk by Marcus Risdell from the Garrick Club. Um, so you may have heard a lot of this before, uh, but it's, it's worth repeating because he's such an interesting character. He's a bit of a chameleon, really. He paints in a huge range of styles. Great variety of subjects, but of course, we now remember him best for his portraits and conversation pieces. And what makes them so special is the way that they tell us so much about everyday life in the 18th century. He's a real storyteller, and he can tell us about anything from the royal family in their vast outfits, pretending to look like a Van Dyke in their old-fashioned 17th century style clothes. Um, to this collector, um, Sir Lawrence Dundas, with what I love about this picture. Some of you may remember we had it here on loan in 2005 for an exhibition. Um, here he is with his great collection of bronzes and uh, Dutch paintings, very much a, a predecessor of George IV in his taste for Dutch paintings. Um, and his furniture, his wonderful carpet, but his greatest treasure of all, his little grandson. This is something that Zofany is wonderful at, is those family relationships, particularly um, children. So here are some children. This is just a lovely scene from everyday life. Um, a porter, he's carrying a hair and He's lost the label and he can't remember the address of where he's going. So these two boys, on their way to school, are explaining how to get there. And what I love is that one of the boys is still eating his breakfast and chewing a sandwich. This is supposed to be one of the earliest ever depictions of a sandwich. I'm not quite sure I go along with that, but I, I think, I mean, you know, putting two bits of bread together with some meat in between them. It's hardly um, a work of genius, is it? Another everyday life scene, this is very famous, um, the portrait of, we think, John Cuff, but possibly another optician, possibly uh, Mr. Dolland, who was George III's optician and whose name lives almost up to the present day, except they've now been taken over by Boots, which is very sad. Dolan de Natchezen is now Boots Optician, so that name um, has been lost. But this is a really lovely picture. Um, it was bought by George III, and it's still in the Royal Collection. And you're recognising here a lot of what you see in those Teniers pictures next door, those shiny pots and 
all those bits and pieces. So he's very much looking back to 17th century Dutch painting in this kind of work. And yet you also get completely different things, like this. This is stylistically so different. The subject matter is so different from what we associate with Zoffany. We think of polite society. Here is a group of people in um, north central Italy celebrating the maize harvest. You see them grabbing those um, uh, corn cobs up in the corner and they're making a horrible noise with their instruments, with the village band. I love this, this guy here, can you see with the, um, he's got a brim handle or something and he's whacking a pottery bowl with it um, to make a noise. And in the background, we don't understand quite why, but in the background, on the left, a very snooty looking gentleman. He maybe looks as a, oh, sorry, or technical problems. It used to be much simpler when we just shouted, didn't it? Um, yeah, snooty gentleman, possibly English grand tourist, but uh, there are many theories about that. So he has a great sense of humour, a great sense of sympathy for people of all types and of all classes. And for himself. And he does many self-portraits. Um, this is one that's full of self-references, full of little jokes about himself as an artist. Um, He's someone whose reputation now is perhaps uh, reviving. For a long time, he wasn't very highly regarded. He's one of those many British 18th century painters who has survived in the shadow of the two greats, Gainsborough and Reynolds. And there are many second raters who are extremely good. Zoffany, Wright of Derby, George Romney, um, perhaps one or two others, who had always been struggling to compete with these, these two great giants of British art. He also suffered um, from falling out of favour with the king and queen, and also simply from being foreign and being a very unconventional person. But uh, his work started to be known really uh, in the 1970s when the first monographic exhibition of his work was held at the National Portrait Gallery in 1976. Some of you may remember that. I certainly do, which a lot of uh, my contemporary art historians are often shocked to hear. Um, because they were all listening to heavy metal at the time, not really into 18th century pictures. So, a bit about Zoffany himself, just to fill you in on, on his background. He was born in 1733 in Frankfurt. His father was a cabinet maker and a court architect. They moved when he was quite little to Regensburg, so he was born in Frankfurt, but they moved to Bavaria and served at the court of the Count of Turn and Taxis, so they actually lived in the court. He grew up in those sort of surroundings, um, but was always destined to work as some kind of an artist or craftsman. And in 1747, aged 14, he was apprenticed to Martin Speer, but being the man he was, he didn't get on very well with his master. In 1750, he ran away to Rome, and in Rome he discovers a whole new world of neoclassicism. Here is an early work, 1756, David and Goliath, and it's thought that this is actually a self-portrait, again possibly full of jokey self-references which people are only now beginning to unravel. So from Rome, he spends quite a lot of time there, um, and then he goes off back to Germany to work in Trier, 
and during the 1750s he's experimenting with a variety of different styles uh, from quite sort of high French style Rococo to this much more pure neoclassical style but he's mostly producing history paintings as happened on the continent there is still great demand for history paintings and paintings for the church then late, late in the 1750s he got married and with the dowry that she brought him he broke free from Germany and came to London. In London he mixes with other Germans to start with and this is one of his first portraits in London. I included this because J.C. Smith as I'm sure many of you know, um, retired to Bath. He was um, a pupil and a assistant of Handel. So he, he came from, where did he come from? Ansbach in Germany. And uh, he wrote operas and things and, and um, arranged music for the opera in London. But he worked very closely with Handel. And Handel left him quite a nice fortune when he died in the 1750s. So Smith, as he then was, not Schmidt anymore, retired to Bath and he lived at the park end of Brock Street, so just on the corner opposite, um, opposite the Royal Crescent. Um, Zoffany knew other musical people like J.C. Bach, all the Germans living in London. But it was quite difficult for him to find work and at first he worked painting clocks for a clockmaker called Stephen Rambo. And then he moved on to a drapery, being, working as a drapery painter for Benjamin Wilson, who was uh, a scene painter and a theatre manager. He, worked, he, he painted portraits as well, but he worked very closely with the theatre. So this is an engraving after one of his lost theatre paintings. This is our friend David Garrick as King Lear in the store. And it's through Wilson that Zoffany meets David Garrick. Of course, that's a very important moment in his life. The first painting that Zoffany made for Garrick was The Farmer's Return. This was uh, a comedy. Um, it was just a short sort of interviewed type of comedy, all in rhyme, written by Garrick himself. And um, it's about this farmer who goes to London and he witnesses um, a, a famous ghost. There was this phenomenon that was, what was happening at the time called the Cock Lane Ghost. And of course it was um, all a hoax. But he comes home to his family in the country and he describes what happens when the medium rapped upon the table. And his family is all standing around him. Um, listening very intently. Again, here you see very strong influence of tenures with all those bits and pieces hanging inside the farmhouse and uh, the, the lantern sitting on the floor there. Um, and this picture was a great success. This, um, although I've written 1763 at the bottom, actually it's um, 1762 because this was um, sent to the Society of Artists exhibition in 1762, the same one that Gainsborough sent um, Lord Nugent to. So if you imagine those two pictures being alongside each other. We actually had the farmer's return here on loan for our Garrick exhibition in 2004, so it's always nice to reunite these pictures after such a long time. Somebody at the exhibition wrote about this picture and said it's a most accurate representation on canvas of that scene as performed at Drury Lane. The painter absolutely transports us in imagination back to the theatre. So Garrick is very pleased with this and he commissions further work from Zoffany, including the very famous conversation piece um, of Garrick with his wife, Ava Maria, the dancer, on the steps of the temple which he built to Shakespeare in his garden at Hampton. The man coming round the corner is their servant, 
the little boy playing on the steps is the nephew, so it's his brother's son. And the big dog is called Dragon. I think that's his brother coming up from the bank, actually. The dog was called Dragon. Um, and Zophany, of course, got on very well with Eva Maria because um, she was Austrian, so they spoke the same language. And uh, he stayed with them at Hampton for the summer holidays and painted a series of um, three or four of these conversation pieces. Are you all familiar with the term conversation piece? Perhaps I should do a little sort of parenthesis and say it's something that originates partly in the Netherlands with the sort of um, polite pictures that we have next door. So it's the sort of de, de hoog, um kind of picture that, you know, with people sitting around a table and chatting to each other and being nicely dressed in a nice interior. Partly comes from, that, partly comes from the French tradition of fête galante and uh, people in gardens, again, sort of chatting and nicely dressed. And those traditions are both absorbed by painters like Hogarth and Francis Heyman into the British portrait tradition and they uh, create this fashion for quite small-scale portraits of groups of people, usually being very polite, but sometimes not quite so polite, particularly when we're dealing with Hogarth. But we've got examples here, like the Divis, so that's why I put the Divis next to the Zophony. Divis is a great um, exemplar of the conversation piece. The Stubbs, you could say, is quite a late conversation piece. They kind of died out by the 1760s, 70s. So that's what they are, small figures on a big canvas, chatting, being polite, family groups. Um, so here are the, the Garricks doing their conversation piece. Here they are having tea on the riverbank. So we're looking in the opposite direction here. And um, Wilson, meanwhile, is extremely annoyed with Garrick because he's taken away one of his best painters. <clears throat> and Garrick heard that Wilson was moaning about this. And he wrote to him, Garrick wrote to Wilson and basically told him to mind his own business and say, it's none of your business where Mr. Zoffany is staying this summer. So this is the view, as I said, the other way from the steps of the temple um, down the river. Um, there's his brother again, fishing, looking back at the family. Garrick's waving to his brother, saying, come and have a cup of tea. Um, and they've got a, the, the gentleman, the, the other gentleman in black um, is there. Uh, he's a friend of the family. Um, so these two portraits hung in Garrick's dining room in his London house. So when he was in London at the Adelphi, just off the Strand, it was a brand new house built by Robert Adam. And in his house at the Adelphi, he could look at pictures of his garden out in the country at Hampton. He also hung the farmer's return in that group in the dining room. And also two other theatrical pictures made at the same time, one of which is Venice Preserved also made in 1762. So this is the pendant, it's the pair to the farmer's return. And the idea is that it shows that Garrick can do tragedy as well as comedy. Um, our version is one of many versions and ours probably isn't the one that belonged to Garrick. Um, there are slight differences between the various versions. So this is an old play that Garrick was, was playing in at Drury Lane. It was an old play already about 100 years old by Thomas Otway. Um, so as I'm sure you know, Jaffia, the uh, Venetian nobleman that Garrick is playing, is attacking his wife because he thinks that she has betrayed his best friend and told the authorities that his best friend is plotting against the Venetian state but actually she hasn't, it's all a mistake, and uh, it doesn't end happily ever after because it's a Jacobean tragedy. They all die at the end. They all get killed by each other. 
as you would expect. These kind of paintings are really important to Garrick, not just as things to impress his mates with when they visit him at home, but as a much wider publicity. These pictures are exhibited at the Society of Artists, so lots of people get to see them. But what's really important is that they get turned into prints. Engravers come along and they copy them on copper plates and print multiple copies which are sold in the shops and distributed very widely. So in 1764, when he went to Paris, he took bundles of these prints with him so that he could give them away to people and make his na name known beyond the British Isles. And he writes home to his brother and says, I'm so plagued here for my prints, or rather prints of me, that I must desire you to send me by the first opportunity six prints from Reynolds's picture, that's the picture of Garrick between tragedy and comedy, which is now at Wadston. Um, you must likewise send me a King Lear by Wilson, that's the one we've just looked at, Hamlet, ditto, Jaffia and Belvedere by Zoffany. Speak to him for two or three, and what else he may have done with me. So anything you can get from Zoffany, send it to me in Paris, because they all want my picture. This is, there we are, this is the engraving by um, James McArdle. They were usually quite high quality mezzo tints, which were more expensive than the standard um, line engravings. Another picture by Zoffany of Garrick, about the same period again. Um, the show was performed at Drury Lane in the spring of 1763, so it might be a, a year or so later. Again, it's an old play. It's The Provoked Wife by Sir John Vanborough, which would fall into the classification of a restoration comedy, I suppose. Garrick rewrote it. Um, he took out all the bawdy bits which were not so enjoyed at, in Garrick's own time and he made a great feature of this character Sir John Brute and he made it into a sort of a pantomime character. Um, Zoffany's studio was in Covent Garden so it was very convenient and we hear about how actors um, would go over to Zoffany's studio or, or they'd bring their costumes over so that he could work with the actors while they were in a particular production. So this picture hung in Garrick's dining room, not at the Adelphi, but at Hampton, um, described in his inventory as a small whole-length portrait of Mr. Garrick in the character of Sir John Brute. Now there's also um, a version of this picture that includes the whole scene with all the other characters. This is at Wolverhampton Art Gallery. But I don't think it's as good as ours. So, because of the success with Garrick, Zoffany is commissioned by other actors um, because they see the effect that Zoffany's work is having on Garrett's celebrity. So he worked with Charles Macklin, here he is as Shylock. Um, this production of The Merchant of Venice is at Covent Garden, the theatre uh, near to Drury Lane. So Garrick is the manager of the Drury Lane theatre. Covent Garden is the other uh, theatre um, which has other actors working in it. Um, this production is in the 1767 to 8 season, so it's a bit later. But Macklin had been acting Shylock for many years. He'd done lots of research. He would go to coffee houses in the city and sit there and observe the Jewish merchants in the city um, and look at their gestures and how they spoke and how they behaved because he wanted to make Shylock a credible character. There, were, there was a large enough Jewish community in London at the time that you couldn't fool people by doing, you know, silly accents and things like that. Um, so he did some serious research and he was very successful as Shylock. He's pretty old by now, he's in his late 60s. And again, this is one scene. This is where he realises that his daughter 
has run away with a Christian gentleman and taken all her jewels with her and he's furious and hopping mad and shaking his fists. Um, but it's often he also worked on another scene, uh, which is the trial scene at the end of the play. Um, so the character sort of grabbing his arm, that's Portia, who was played by Macklin's daughter. Um, and it's a rather an odd picture. It's partly unfinished, but it's also odd because it contains some real people. The judge sitting on the far left in the red robes, that's actually Lord Mansfield, who's a great um, advocate of the day. And um, for reasons that, again, are much discussed, um, there he is included in the picture. Um, so that's um, Macklin. Sometimes an actor would, or, or there, would, there would be a scene with several actors in it, and all the different actors would commission their own version of the picture, um, as happened with this one, Love in a Village. So this is our version, which has got in the background the children of Charles I by Van Dyck which would have been a very familiar picture to Zoffany, because by this time he was working with the royal family, so he knew the royal collection by then. So here we are, uh, from left to right, the actors are Edward Shooter, John Beard and John Dunstall. Now John Beard is really the only one who is remembered today, mainly because of his work with Handel. Love in the Village was a sort of little musical um, by Isaac Bickerstaff, and Beard was one of the great um, English tenors of his day, very different from the Italian opera singers, but he did work a lot with Handel on oratorios, particularly um, Messiah and Samson, I think. I'll check that, but I think he might have been the original Samson. Um, so, this one was exhibited at the Society of Artists, 1767, and again in 1768. I think that would have been the two versions. Um, we also have this. This is not on display, because we thought it looked a bit boring. It looks boring, but it's really interesting. This is downstairs. Love in a Village copied, we think, by John Finlayson. But this isn't a black and white photo, this is a colour photo, but he's not used any colours. Why has he done that? Well, he needs to make another engraving of Love in a Village. And rather than sit in front of the original picture, which is going off to exhibition or it's going off to its owner or whatever it might be. He makes a quick copy of it in black and white on canvas. Notice that the painting in the background has disappeared. The reason for that is that the two different versions had different pictures in the background as Finlayson's final engraving shows us. So this is Finlayson's mezzo tint and here he's put the other picture in the background, this is the Judgment of Solomon that's going on. So um, I forget now where this painting with the Judgment of Solomon is. I think it's in um, America, but it was in the Zofany show at the Royal Academy last year. We also have another of these. This is the other one. This is um, a painting called, the, a, a play called The Devil on Two Sticks. And the actor in the big wig is Samuel Foote, who plays the devil disguised as a doctor. Um, the play is a satire on the medical profession. And um, this little man here, um, he's actually a, a village cobbler and he is being examined by the devil who uh, licenses him as a physician. The reason it's called The Devil on Two Sticks is that um, the foot who wrote the play, um, ironically, only had one foot. He had a wooden leg 
and to walk he would use his wooden leg and a stick, so hence the two sticks. So the actual actor had two sticks, if that makes any sense. Um, there's the mezzo tint, and there's the original painting, which is in Castle Howard. Now, the reason I have to explain who Dr. Last is, so Dr. Last is the cobbler who's been made a doctor, even though he knows nothing about medicine, is that he appears to, uh, he seems to appear in another of our paintings. Have a look at, well, it's a bit high up now. Uh, by the way, we will sort out the lighting. We've got the lighting engineer coming on Thursday to light those higher up pictures. Um, but this other man's chewing something. That's what I'm really interested in. It looks like he's chewing a biscuit or something. Okay, now moving on from the uh, very low to high society. So Garrick doesn't just introduce Sophony to theatre people. He also has friends in very high places, like the Earl of Butte. And these are the children of the Earl of Butte, who was the Prime Minister, and lived with his family at Kew, next door to the royal family. So through them, Zophany was introduced to the royal family, comes to the attention of the Queen, and she commissioned him to paint a whole series of intimate family portraits. It's a very key moment in royal portraiture, this meeting between the young German princess and the German painter who had grown up at court. He would have known lots of people that she knew, and he was very comfortable with court etiquette and so on. Here's his first painting for the Queen, a very informal portrait of her at her dressing table with her children. And it shows us all the details, very, very precisely painted, of her house, Buckingham House. And we can identify almost everything in these rooms that still exists in the Royal Collection. Here is the portrait of Queen Charlotte herself. Now, as you know, we can't be 100% sure that this is by Zoffany. Um, mainly because it doesn't look quite right. On the other hand, there's no reason to think it's by anyone else. Um, and one big clue to its being by Zoffany is this portrait. This is another in the series for Queen Charlotte of her two little sons, Prince of Wales and the Duke of York, in the warm room at Buckingham House, with Again, remember the children of Charles I, which is in the Love in a Village picture. So there it is. Um, another Van Dyck here. Um, that Van Dyck is in the Royal Collection. The uh, Maratha portrait of the Christ Child is in the Royal Collection. But the portraits of the King and Queen don't appear to exist. Or do they? Because there's the portrait of the Queen. If I flip her around, there's ours. So, there's another mystery to be solved. But, whether this is by Zoffany or not, we know that he was a very important person in the royal household and also a very important member of the Royal Academy, which was founded in 1768. And although Zoffany wasn't a founder member, he was accorded the same status as a founder. And for the king, he did this wonderful group portrait of all the founding members. And he is right on the left. You see him sitting at the front on the left with his green coat on. I should also mention, as everyone always does, the two ladies who were not present because there were unladylike things going on with the nude model. And um, so they're just represented by their portraits. And the one who's looking at you, not in profile, that's Angelica Kaufman. Now, by this time, 1770s, he's getting itchy feet. And he approached Captain Cook, 
um, about travelling to the South Seas with him, because Captain Cook was looking for competent artists to take with him to record what they saw on their adventures. Um, but there were reasons why he couldn't go, and so he decided to go back to Italy. When the Queen heard he was going back to Italy, she asked him to paint the Uffizi Gallery, because she'd heard so much about the beautiful paintings there, and she knew she'd never get a chance to visit. Sorry, I've missed one out, never mind. Um, he did decide to go to India instead. Um, I won't say too much about his time in India because Charles Gregg is going to be talking about that in his lecture next Monday, and he knows infinitely more about it than I do. It was a long journey, it took eight months from London to Calcutta, and he arrived in September um, 1783. And General McCartney wrote in a letter, the glorious field of Bengal remains open for him. He was very lucky because as soon as he arrived, he was taken up by the governor of Bengal, Warren Hastings. He did lots of portraits of Warren Hastings, including this one. And looking at this, I couldn't help thinking, this looks rather familiar. I think I have seen before a gentleman walking with his wife, holding out his hat and a stick under a tree, admiring the landscape, with a little girl following them. Where have I seen that before? And I wonder if Zoffany had seen the Bayern family at some point. Warren Hastings is an extraordinary man. He is the civil servant, essentially. He's employed by the East India Company but he finds himself in charge of the whole of Bengal, which is a vast area, a huge state, um, and he, he becomes Governor General in 1773. And Hastings and his mates all become patrons of Zoffany. They've all got lots of money, and they give Zoffany lots of work. One of Hastings' closest associates is James Oriel, who, like him, has a villa at Alipore. Um, it's a very smart suburb of Calcutta. So here's Hastings in his garden, with his villa in the background. And here is James Oriole, we think, in the garden of his villa. So we'll just spend some time looking at this picture. I won't spend too long, because I know I've gone over time as usual. We know that James Oriel had a beautiful garden because it was advertised in 1784 with this description. The garden attached to the larger house is not only amply stocked with exotics and fruit trees of various kinds, but is in a state of cultivation superior to most and inferior to none about Calcutta. So the trees, we can recognize some. Zoffany was really interested in the natural history and he spent a lot of time painting landscapes and um, trees and animals as well. He did some wonderful elephants and tigers and things. Um, so the tree in the background on the left, that's a banyan tree. This funny tree in the foreground with the fruits hanging off it, that's a jackfruit tree. And then there's a, a very, very tall palm tree at the back. Um, Little buildings which Zoffany's added, probably to give it a sort of Indian flavour. So there's what looks, um, on the left, what looks like a little Islamic tomb. But this has been described as the chronicle of a colonial dynasty in formation. Basically, who these people are is um, three brothers and two sisters, and the husbands of the two sisters. We know who they all are because someone has later on added all their names along the lower edge. And I must apologise because the conservator has added a very neat um, strip of black around the edge to make it look all neat and tidy, but she's actually covered up some of the names, which is a shame. Um, but I'll tell you who they are anyway. They are the, the Oriol family. They were originally Huguenots from Lyon and their father was exiled in 1685, um, as so many were at the time of the Edict of Nantes, and he went first of all to Lisbon, and then, as you know, there was a great earthquake in Lisbon in 1757. Um, 
And so he went to live in Hampstead. They lived at North End. And he died in 1770. So all his children are left um, with some of his um, not huge wealth. And they, all but two, two girls, gradually make their way to India. So I'll just look at the, them individually. This gentleman in green, this is the owner of the garden. Um, I think he's the oldest brother, James Peter Oriole. He comes to India in the year his father dies, 1770, and he works for the East India Company. By 1782, at the time this was painted, he was secretary to the governing council of the presidency of Bengal. So in other words, he works very closely with Warren Hastings. But in 1783, he resigned and he went home to England. And it may be that before he went, he commissioned this picture from Zofany to record this brief time when he and his brothers and sisters were all living together in Calcutta. Um, he made lots and lots of money. Um, during the 1770s, he had contracts for supplying rice to armies in the other presidencies. Um, presidencies are regions of the East India Company. From that, from supplying rice to those huge armies, he got a 15% commission. So he had lots and lots and lots of money. As you probably know, Warren Hastings was later charged with corruption, and this was the kind of thing that was troubling people back home, the amount of money that people seemed to be raking in from this kind of semi-bureaucratic work that seemed to be exploiting not only the Indians but also some of the British people who were working there. Okay, now these two, um, the one in red, he is actually a soldier in the, um, in, in the military wing of the East India Company. He's called Charles. He's a captain in the army. He also left in 1783. Then the other brother, the one with his arms folded, that is John, who also works for the East India Company. Then we come to the ladies. The one in sort of greenish blue, that is Charlotte. And she married Thomas Dashwood, who is the slightly larger gentleman playing chess there. The other sister in pink, that is Sophia, and she married the other gentleman, the gentleman on the left, John Crinson. She brought with her £30,000, which was a very nice sum for a tradesman's daughter. Um, the only other thing I know about her is that her granddaughter recalled that she was very quiet and she looks like quite a quiet person. Um, so John Prince, the gentleman in sort of buff coloured suit, he came to the East India Company as a soldier, as a military cadet, um, but he defected very quickly from the army to work in the indigo trade. He's actually seen as the founder of the indigo trade in India, um, a very important textile merchant. His family was a major colonial family. His, his children all uh, went out to India and worked there. Um, but he himself made lots of money out of indigo textile trade and printing cotton fabrics in Bengal. So he arrived in India penniless, he was a younger son, left 16 years later with £40,000. And then he returned to England and he became an MP. Eventually, um, he actually lost quite a lot of money. He went to work in the city and lost quite a lot of money. He retired to Clifton, which was where you had to retire when you'd lost your money. Um, but all eight of his sons went on to have very successful careers in India. Did I tell you about Mr. Dashwood? I didn't. Mr. Dashwood, um, people are going to ask if they were related to the, uh, Sir Francis Dashwood of West Wickham. 
They are, but he was a cousin, he was a poor relation, he was a younger son, so if you're a younger son, you don't have any money, you go to India and make some. And he worked for the East India Company and was the superintendent for the supply of stationery. And then in 1800, he became the collector of government customs in Calcutta. So again, a good source of money. Let's have a look now at the household. Um, British colonists in India, although um, they may have come from quite humble backgrounds, had loads and loads and loads of servants. They saw that there was a caste system operating in India and they interpreted it, interpreted it into a very rigid hierarchy of households and other servants. And the British back home would look at this and they were quite sort of scandalised by the way that they exploited these people and um, had such large numbers of servants. We know who these servants are um, because of a publication uh, that was made a bit later, 1798, called Manners, Customs and Dresses of the Hindus. Um, so I'm going to show you, alongside pictures from the Zophany, I'm going to show you um, pictures from Solvins's book from the 1790s. Um, it's actually a later French edition I'm using. So, start with this man here. This is the hooker birder refilling Mr. Princess's pipe. So that's a sort of a whole one. You can see how he dressed and how he, he carries um, the water pipe. So he's refilling it with tobacco from that very nice little tobacco holder thing. Then this is the household bearer um, just filling the teapot from the kettle. Um, there is a um, household servant. Then we have this chap. Now this is a much higher rank, much higher caste of person. This is the Banyan, who's the head of the household. Um, you can see how they're wearing a kind of a uniform, that there is a certain type of dress that goes with each different sort of job. So you've got this lovely long white kurta on. It's interesting if you look at the fabrics, how fine the muslin is that he's wearing. It's nice and cool, whereas the British people are all sort of wrapped up in um, woolen suits and things, and they are actually looking quite shiny if you look at the, the real picture. Then we have the courier, um, who's here wearing, I think, a beautiful colour, sort of aubergine-coloured suit. And he's the person who takes the important messages, so he works for the East India Company and carries messages between the offices. There's also an odd one out. This boy here, um, he is not dressed in Indian dress, although he's got a sort of pretend turban on. He's dressed in ordinary English boy clothes. It's possible that he's not Indian at all, but African. He may be someone who was called Nabob. He was a slave who belonged to John Oriel. So John Oriel is the one with his arms folded. Um, and we know about him because there was a dispute between John Oriel and the uh, uh, memoir writer, um, William Hickey. John Oriel went back to England for a few years and he asked Hickey to look after this boy. And Hickey thought he'd actually given him, he was a slave, he thought he'd actually given him to him. Um, and then when Oriol came back in 1783, he asked for his slave back. And Hickey was very annoyed, he didn't want to give him back. So they decided to ask the boy himself. And he chose Mr. Oriol, so Hickey was even more annoyed. So that's Nabob, who this might be. But what's so interesting to us, I think, is all the tea things. And, um, Matthew's had a good look at these and he's identified them all and essentially all of these things with the possible exception of the teapot which looks very much like a teapot that still belongs to the Dashwood family and has a London hallmark. Um, all of these other things are imported from China. 
Tea is still very expensive. It is imported into India from China. The Indian tea trade hasn't yet started. It was the, the British transplanted it from China so they could get their supplies of tea. Have a look at the furniture as well. This is very beautiful Sheraton style japanned chair. So it's um, black lacquer with gilding. And again, almost certainly made in China to a British design. They're playing chess. There wasn't much else to do. Just looking at the whole picture again. Um, the composition isn't Zofany's most imaginative. And there's a slight sense of detachment between all the people. There doesn't seem to be much eye contact going on. The reason for that seems to be is that they weren't all in the same place at the same time. Zofany had to paint them separately over quite a long period because they all went back to India, uh, sorry, back to England at various different stages between 1783 and 1787. And Zofany himself was traveling around India. But what's important is that the girls are at the center. They're the main focus of the picture and they've been placed at the center with their husbands. So this picture becomes almost like a sort of a family tree. It's a celebration not only of all these siblings being together in India for a short time, but also it's a celebration of their marriages. And the three brothers were all about to go off back home to England, but they left their sisters in India in the safe hands of these friends of theirs. So it's also a celebration of friendship as well as of um, the family and of marriage. Okay, I just, if you can bear with me, I just wanted to say something about one more picture that I really felt I should explain. Oh yes, Zofany in old age, he comes back to England of course, he is minted after his visit to India, I uh, can't remember who I've got, I haven't got any figures here about how rich he was, but he would charge, in India, he would charge as much for a portrait as Sir Joshua Reynolds would charge in London, which was incredibly cheeky, but he just knew how much money was swilling around out there. So he comes home very wealthy, he retires to Chiswick and he gradually stops painting. Here he is in old age, I love those spectacles on the end of his nose. And um, can you see what he's holding? It's a hooker snake, so it's from his pipe that he's brought home from India. And he really, really loved a good smoke, so I think it was probably his favourite souvenir from India and I can imagine him sitting there puffing away in the evenings surrounded by his family. He late leaves an important legacy. He has a number of pupils. Probably his, one of his most important legacies is his pioneering of theatrical paintings and without Zofany we wouldn't have had Samuel de Wilde which we've, why we've put three of de Wilde's paintings above the Zofany's. But I also want to talk about um, Henry Walton. Henry Walton was a pupil of Zofany's. We know very little about him, which is a pity because he's a wonderful painter. He didn't need to work for a living because he was a country gent. Um, he came from Norfolk and he studied with Zofany. A friend of his described how he showed so decided a turn for painting as to induce his friends to place him under Zofany. You can see Zofany's influence very strongly, but his output was very small. We were given this picture in 2004. I won't tell you the story now of how it came to be here. Um, but we were thrilled to have this because I, I love Henry Walton. I think he's a wonderful painter and he really isn't known in the West. Um, there are quite a few of his paintings in East Anglian collections and in the Tate as well. But when this came here, um, we knew it was a portrait of William Brereton, who, I don't know if I pronounce his name properly, but he was an actor. And 
his father was the master of ceremonies in Bath, so he was born in Bath, and there's a Bath connection. And for many years, he played in David Garrick's company. He wasn't that good an actor. Somebody said, he is a pretty figure, but wants lemon in his voice. And someone else said he was too contemptible for criticism. But he retained his connections with Bath. He married an actress from Bath called Priscilla Hopkins. But by 1785, a few years after this was painted, he was beginning to behave very oddly, um, both on and off stage. Eventually, he tried to kill Priscilla, and so he was committed to the Hoxton Asylum, and he died there in 1787. Hoxton, of course, then was not the extremely cool place that it is now. Um, Priscilla, after he died, was able to marry again. She married John Philip Campbell, who, of course, was one of the great, great actors, successor to David Garrick. But when we got this, we thought, I just assumed that the portrait over the fireplace was of David Garrick because he's got the same haircut and it looks just like him and because there was this strong personal bond between them, I thought it was Garrick. It actually turns out to be Henry Woodward. Of course, there it is, just blown up from you. Henry Woodward is familiar to you all from this ceramic figure. Playing a character in a play by Garrick, so Garrick is never far away. We were a bit surprised when this picture turned up. It was in a sale in Sotheby's in 2000, and it turned up in a private collection, and I went to see it, and it's the same picture. And we think it's Henry Woodward. It's definitely not. Looking at the original, it's definitely not Garrick. It's probably Henry Woodward, and it's been signed. It's by Benjamin van der Gucht who is another follower of Zoffany, another theatrical painter, um, and it's signed and dated 1778. So there's another bit of a mystery to be solved there. Sorry to throw all these mysteries at you, but it's just to, to show you how complicated everything is, and everything sort of ties together in funny ways, particularly when you're dealing with Zoffany, because he's one of those people who was so involved with so many different things. But we are lucky to have so many pictures by Zoffany, and um, I leave you with that. But you don't need to look at that, because if you just turn around, you've got the real ones behind you. Um, but uh, if you do have any questions, of course, you're very welcome to ask either now, or if you're a shy little thing and don't want to shut them you can always come and ask me later on. Thank <laughs> you.